The series opens up in Alanga, South Africa where the village high priest, Ndaibo explains the power of the mystical tree of life. It is believed that the tree of life connects the world of the living to the world of the dead, and the world of those who haven't been born yet. In ancient times, the tree prospered and the world was full of magic. The group of people who looked after the tree, named the Wise Ones, were more powerful in their magic as compared to normal people. However, as time passed they started growing greedy, and wanted to control the source of all magic. Hence they tried to seize the Tree of Life by force. Fortunately, the most powerful among the Wise Ones saw this greed and created special human beings from the roots of the Tree of Life to protect it from destruction. These special protectors were named the Brave Ones. In the present day, the bloodline of the Brave Ones is dwindling, and the Tree of Life has been hidden. Only the sect of people who believe in its magic can still see the tree. This sect of people who are the descendants of the Wise Ones, are headed by the village high priest, and his daughter, Nasasa. Elsewhere in Alanga, the discussion about a casino being built over the land of the local community heats up in the Gasa household. Funaka Gasa, the elder daughter of Wheel and Tandaza Gasa is a local activist who wants the construction of the casino, to stop. She argues that the casino, being built by corrupt developers, will evict the local people out of their own homes. Although her dad and mum don't sound as vocal about the issue as her, Nitsuki, Funika's younger sister says that the building won't stop until the developers are confronted head on. Nitsuki's argumentative and bold nature irritates her mother who shuts her down coldly. Meanwhile, Funika's fiancé, Enkosi also is a vocal activist against the forceful development. Nearby, the construction work for the new casino is in full swing. However, while digging the ground, one of the engineers finds some strange-looking artifacts on the site, and halts the construction work. Just as the engineer holds the artifacts, young Nitsuki who is heading towards her work begins to feel dizzy, and stops to take a breather by the roadside. Simultaneously, the artifacts begin to glow and vibrate as if they sense the presence of something magical nearby. Nitsuki soon recovers from her dizziness, and leaves for her work. Meanwhile, the engineer calls the developer of the casino, Lethando, and informs him about the artifacts that he found. Lethando orders the construction to be halted for a day, and asks the engineer to send the artifacts to him. Later at his house, Lethando gets quite happy when his assistant texts him that the artifacts that were recovered earlier turned out to be incredibly valuable bracelets from the ancient times. Lethando plans to donate these bracelets to the city museum and use the donation to force the city council to remove the angry locals that are protesting against the construction of his casino. However, his happiness is soon cut short. His wife, Ayanda informs him that their son, Ludani has been regularly seeing mysterious figures cloaked in white. Ludani is suffering from a grave illness, and shows no signs of improvement despite visiting international pediatricians. Despite Lethando's refusal to believe in magic, Ayanda later visits her uncle, Ndaibo, the high priest for help regarding her son. Ndaibo suggests that there is only one way to save the kid, the blood of a brave one. However, for this to happen, a brave one will have to appear, die, get reborn, and be bestowed with full power through a secret ancient weapon. And this phenomenon is only possible when the earth, sun, and moon align in a special way. Although the possibility of all this happening sounds next to impossible, Ayanda has hope as there is a major lunar eclipse next week. The sun, moon and earth will be aligning in a way that will give the moon a red coloration, a phenomenon known as the blood moon. When Ayanda reaches back her home that night, she reveals all this information to her husband, who sounds unconvinced about the existence of magic. He tries to convince her that there is no such thing as a brave one. However, she ignores his protests and tells him that a brave one will appear when the tree of life is threatened. And since the tree of life is in Alanga, this can be achieved if the small village of Alanga is threatened. A few days later, Antiski gets a gig at the city museum as a waitress for a fundraiser dinner. Her sister, Funika also is invited to the event through Ayanda's foundation which mentors local women in Alanga. But, Funika plans to use this chance to talk to any VIPs present at the dinner to raise awareness about the evictions happening in her village to develop the casino. However, Funika has never met or talked to Ayanda and doesn't know that Ayanda's husband is the chief developer behind the casino. At the fundraiser dinner, Funika tries to talk to various rich and influential people about her village. When she does not get any meaningful reaction, she confronts one of the main investors behind the casino in front of everyone. The guards immediately grab Funika and throw her out of the event. Meanwhile, Nitsuki manages to steal a bracelet from the same investor that Funika confronted earlier. She is about to slip out of the event unnoticed when a guard suddenly stops her to search her. However, Sia, a rising singer-songwriter, who is performing at the event stops the guard. Sia has been trying to get close to Nitsuki for quite a while, and using his influence, he drops her outside the fundraiser event without being searched. Also at the fundraiser event, 
The two bracelets that were discovered at the site of the casino development are shown to the audience. Ayanda, who is also present at the event with her husband, immediately realizes that these bracelets are the ancient weapons that her uncle and Daibo talked about. Without wasting any time, she pressurizes her husband to get her the bracelets and fasten the evictions of the local people in Alanga. However, Lathanda refuses both her proposals as he knows that several people at Alanga village are already agitated by the development of the casino. But Ayanda refuses to be content with her husband's inactivity and takes things into her own hands. A few days later, she meets the counselor Enkomo of Alanga and threatens him to quickly evict the locals of Alanga. She hopes this will fasten the demolishing of local houses, threatening the tree of life, and ultimately forcing a brave one to appear. Counselor Enkomo reluctantly agrees to her threats. Meanwhile, two guards enter the Gasa household and forcibly grab Nitsuki at gunpoint. They demand her to return the bracelet that she stole at the fundraiser event. Fortunately, Enkosi arrives at the house and quickly disarms the guards. He then threatens them to leave Nitsuki alone. When the guards run away, Tandaza Gasa confronts Nitsuki and forces her to admit that she did steal the bracelet. Overwhelmed by all the events, Nitsuki runs out of the house. Funika follows her and stops her only a few meters away from their house. She confronts Nitsuki who breaks down and promises to return the bracelet to the lady she stole it from. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by loud bangs and bike noises. Several bikers have entered the neighborhood along with hired goons who are forcibly evicting people out of their homes. To their horror, the bikers start to follow them and Funika concludes they are coming after her because of her vocal nature against the casino's development. The two sisters run away and hide inside a shed. Unfortunately, before they can run away from the shed, the bikers surround them. The biker then descends from his bike and stabs Funika with a knife, killing her on the spot. Shocked by this horrific scene, Nitsuki freezes and stares silently at her sister's lifeless body. Suddenly, a biker appears behind her and slits her throat, leaving her dead near Funika's corpse. However, it is the night of the blood moon. And as the moon rises in the sky, the bracelet kept in the city museum begins to glow. Soon afterwards, Nitsuka's wounds heal automatically and she comes back to life. But, her sister, Fonika is still dead and the sight of her dead body sends her into a deep shock. A shock Nitsuki runs back home and barely manages to tell her family about the tragic death. The news of Funika's death spreads like wildfire. An enraged Latando confronts his wife, Ayanda, about her involvement in the matter. While she refuses to take responsibility for Funika's death, she openly admits that it was her who forced the evictions. Latando once more tries to reason that whatever she is doing will not cure their son. But Ayanda is adamant to seek any possible way. In the meantime, at the temple of the high priest, Nasusa talks to a couple who had a baby on the day of the blood moon. She asks the couple to leave their baby at the temple for a night so that it can be blessed. In reality, Nasusa believes that the baby is a brave one and plans to keep it at the temple. Unable to refuse a powerful religious figure like Nasusa, the couple leave their baby reluctantly in the care of the temple's priestesses. On the other hand, Latando asks his wife Ayanda to visit Funika's family. He commands his wife to console the grieving family and pay the funeral costs so that they can build a positive image of their company. Ayanda agrees to the idea, but before visiting the Gasa household, she goes to her uncle's temple. There, she reveals to Endaibo that the artifacts on display at the city museum are in fact the ancient weapons of the brave one. If she can retrieve those bracelets, they can be a step closer to the return of a brave one. Following this, Ayanda visits the Gasa household where she expresses deep condolence on the passing of Funika. There, she also overhears the couple whose daughter was born on the night of the blood moon and is kept in the temple of the high priest. Suspecting the infant to be a brave one, Ayanda later hires a goon to steal the newborn from the temple. That night, Nitsuki goes out on a date with Sia, the upcoming singer-songwriter to divert her minds off the death of her sister. Their date goes smoothly at first but Sia's ex-girlfriend soon interferes with their conversation. However, Sia shows no interest in her, and the ex-girlfriend leaves without causing much trouble. But when Nitsuki goes to the washroom, the ex-girlfriend confronts her. After calling Nitsuki a low-class girl, she tells her that Sia would never seriously date a girl like her. An enraged Nitsuki tries to control her anger, but involuntarily causes her agitator to float a few feet above the ground. Although she regains her calm only seconds later, this is the first time that Nitsuki notices that she has supernatural powers. Spooked out by the event, she rushes from her date and goes home. A few days later, Ayanda gets hold of Nitsuki and the two women have a conversation. Ayanda has heard that the latter is a clever thief as evident by how quickly she stole a bracelet at the fundraiser dinner a few weeks ago. 
she threatens Netsuki to steal the ancient bracelets from the city museum for her, or else she will use all her connections to evict Netsuki's family from the village. With no choice left, the young girl accepts her proposal. That night, Nitsuki covers her face and body completely with black clothes and expertly climbs the walls of the city museum. Inside, she wriggles past the guards and with some luck, she makes her way to the main room where the bracelets are kept. However, as she physically gets closer and closer to the bracelets, the artifacts begin to glow and vibrate violently. Ultimately, the power radiating from the bracelets shatters the protective glass around it. Taking full advantage of this, Nitsuki grabs them and hightails out of the museum. However, the guards are soon alerted and they give chase behind her. Outside, she throws the bracelets in a car awaiting her. But before she can get into the vehicle, it rushes away, leaving her alone. Nitsuki immediately runs towards the city center where she throws away her black outer clothes and rushes towards Sia's home. The guards soon arrive on the spot but after seeing the young couple getting intimate, they head out, unable to recognize Nitsuki. On the other hand, Ayanda gets the bracelets and immediately heads towards the high priest's temple. There she notices the young couple she saw in the Gasa household with their baby. Curious, she questions her uncle, the high priest Endaibo about it. However, Endaibo dismisses her questions and asks her to hand the bracelets. As Endaibo marvels at the bracelets, Ayanda starts checking out the various inscriptions kept on her uncle's table. Suddenly, she sees a drawing of a priest sacrificing a baby who is kept between the two bracelets. This makes Ayanda realize that Endaibo never wanted to help her or her son. He simply wanted the power of the brave ones for himself. Cautiously, she turns around only to find her uncle threateningly standing close to her with a knife in his hands. However, she manages to create a bit of separation with him. Desperate to save the life of her son, she attacks Endaibo with all her might and manages to push him on the ground. To her horror, Endaibo accidentally stabs and kills himself during the fall. She quickly gathers all the inscriptions, the bracelet, and runs away from the temple before anyone can notice her. A few days after the incident, Ayanda begins to study the scrolls that she stole from her uncle. She knows the only way to cure her son is through the blood of a brave one. Remembering the couple and their newborn in the temple, she concludes that the baby must be a brave one which is why her uncle had invited them to the temple. Following this, she once more hires a goon and pays him to kidnap the newborn baby from the temple. In the meantime, Nitsuki strolls around the village with a friend when she begins to hear whispers calling out to her. Zoned out, she follows the whispers to a small, dingy tin shelter. There, she enters a separate realm and comes face to face with the Tree of Life for the first time. Elsewhere, Enkosi is still depressed and angered by the death of his fiancée, Fenuka. He urges the inhabitants of Alanga village to honor her memory by continuing to fight for their rightful land against the casino developers. Furthermore, he strongly believes that it was the counselor Enkomo who ordered the attack on Fenuka. Hence, he and a group of several Alanga residents start a riot near the counselor's home. Soon afterwards, the counselor's car comes to his home and the riots turn more violent. The protesters begin attacking the police and throw homemade petrol bombs at them. In response, the police identify Enkosi as a leader of the protest and arrest him immediately. However, a few minutes later he sees a bike enter the counselor's home. The bike is similar to the ones that entered the village on the day when Fenuka was killed. This only confirms his theory that counselor Enkomo was behind her death. But he cannot do anything with the information right now as he is taken to the local police station. The following morning, after breakfast with her husband, Ayanda announces that she will be having a busy day and won't be able to come home until late night. However, she slips towards their farmhouse instead. There, she begins preparing for the ritual to sacrifice the baby that she saw at the high priest's temple. Currently, her goons are making their way to the temple to steal the baby. On the other hand, Nitsuki also visits the temple as she has been having nightmares about her sister's death. There, she talks to Nasusa about all the weird things happening to her. But their conversation is quickly interrupted by two goons sent by Ayanda's. The goons attack the priestesses of the temple, and one of them runs away with the newborn kid. The other goon knocks out the father of the baby and pushes Nasusa to the ground. However, Nitsuki stands in his way with a menacing look on her face. Unbothered, the goon tries to slash her with a knife, but she proves to be too fast and too strong for him. She grabs the knife with her hand and throws the attacker against the wall with relative ease. But after the short burst of incredible power, she passes out on the spot. A stunned Nasusa who saw all of this happening, rushes to Nitsuki and sees a magical sight. The wound on Nitsuki's palm quickly heals. This confirms that Nitsuki and not the newborn baby is the brave one who reappeared on the day of the blood moon. However, the goon that escaped delivers the baby to Ayanda. Despite being utterly disgusted at what she is about to do, Ayanda grabs the baby and heads towards her farmhouse. There she places the bracelets on either side of the baby and prepares to sacrifice it. Fortunately, 
Her husband, who is alerted by the guards about Ayanda's unusual appearance at the farmhouse, arrives there in the nick of time. He stops her right before she can kill the baby and confronts her. Jolted back to her senses, Ayanda breaks down and says this is the only way to save their son. However, soon afterwards she realizes that the bracelets didn't glow even when the baby was near them. This could only mean one thing. The baby is not a brave one. The real brave one, Nitsuki, wakes up in the temple of the high priest where Nasusa tells her about her true identity. Overwhelmed by the information, Nitsuki runs away from the temple while Nasusa yells at her to embrace her true identity. Meanwhile, Enkosi is freed by the police under one condition. If he doesn't pursue Counselor Nakomo and remains silent about Fenuka's death, they will also not press charges against the bar he runs where he serves illegally imported alcohol. However, as soon as Enkosi is free from the jail, he immediately goes to the counselor's home with the intention of killing him. But, before he can shoot the counselor Enkomo, one of the private guards sneaks behind him and knocks him unconscious. Enkosi is then taken to a secluded warehouse, where he is tied to a chair and kept alone. A few days pass and Nitsuki visits Sia's home in the city to divert her mind from the trauma of what happened at the high priest's temple. The two increasingly get close to each other and frequently make passionate love. However, one morning during breakfast, Sia gets a phone call from Counselor Enkomo asking him to visit Alanga as soon as possible. It is then revealed that Sia is Counselor Enkomo's son. However, unbeknownst to Sia, Enkomo plans to use his image of an upcoming star to soften the public's outrage at Funaka's death and the ongoing evictions. In the meantime, Ayanda once again visits the temple of the high priest where she is confronted by Endaibo's son. Jimmy. However, she threatens to tell the police that Endaibo was planning to sacrifice a kid in the temple. Reluctantly, Jimmy agrees to work with Ayanda, and the duo then sit down for a ritual to summon the spirit of Endaibo. After a while, Endaibo's spirit enters Jimmy's body and starts talking to Ayanda. He reveals that the newborn is not a brave one. Instead, the brave one who returned on the blood moon is a young woman of around 20 years old. Furthermore, he gives an ominous warning. The only way to save Ayanda's son is by killing and then getting the blood of the brave one. A few days later, Counselor Enkomo comes to Alanga with his son, Sia. His plan goes exactly as he hoped for and the crowd dances to Sia's tombs. Enkomo then takes to the stage and promises that the new casino being built will only bring more money and prosperity to the people who live in Alanga. And the people whose houses are demolished will be relocated in a better place along with several facilities. This works like a charm and the opinion of the crowd begins to shift in favor of Ankomo. Meanwhile, one of Enkosi's friends informs Nitsuki that he has been missing for the past few days. Furthermore, he reveals that Enkosi had suspected Counselor Enkomo of murdering Fenuka. This new information leaves Nitsuki shocked, and she immediately begins searching for Enkosi. On top of this, when she notices Counselor Enkomo introducing Sia as his son, she feels betrayed. That night, Nitsuki jumps inside the boot of Counselor Enkomo's car and unknowingly joins him on a trip to the warehouse where Enkosi is held hostage. Fortunately, Sia notices this and also joins his father on the trip so that he can protect Nitsuki from potentially being caught by his father's goons. Elsewhere, Ayanda who is desperate to know the identity of the Brave One visits Nasusa at the temple. Here, it is revealed that Ayanda and Nasusa are sisters. However, Nasusa refuses to help her and accuses her of turning her back to their mother. Ayanda begs Nasusa to save her son's life, but the latter coldly replies that the death of her son is a punishment for her arrogant behavior. Emotionally distraught and unstable, Ayanda suddenly grabs Nasus's neck and tries to choke her. Fortunately, one of the priestesses of the temple intervenes and knocks Ayanda out cold. On the other hand, Counselor Enkomo, his goons, Sia, and coincidentally Nitsuki arrive at the warehouse, where Enkosi is held hostage. The counselor plans to frame Enkosi in the death of Fenuka by forging his fingerprints on the knife with which the murder was committed. After he and his goons enter the warehouse, Sia lingers outside for a while. When everyone is gone, he opens the boot and lets Nitsuki out. However, she refuses to accept any help from him as she feels betrayed that he is the son of the man who murdered her sister. But Sia promises that he is not like his father and begs to let him help her. He plans to go inside and check for Enkosi while he suggests Nitsuki to stay outside, a plan that Nitsuki reluctantly agrees to. In the ending scene, Nitsuki barges into the warehouse when Sia doesn't return back even after a while. Inside, she finds Enkosi dangling by the rope while being surrounded by Counselor Enkomo 
and his goons. Suddenly, everyone is on high alert seeing the uninvited girl suddenly appear in the warehouse. The goons begin to encircle her, and Counselor Enkomo points his gun at her. Enraged, Nitsuki cannot control her powers and creates a powerful shock wave that knocks out everyone, including herself. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.